All right, turn with me to Matthew 7. Uh, again, we didn't quite finish the Sermon on the Mount last time, but as we saw how Jesus is the only way of salvation, he says he is the narrow gate, the narrow path. It's only through Christ that anybody can be saved. He's, uh, we saw that he is the door of salvation. You have to come through Christ for salvation. You, you have to come through Christ to receive forgiveness of sin to receive eternal life. Jesus can say all these things because he's the ultimate judge. He sets the standards, not us. He sets the, the rules. If you reject Christ, you will find yourself, what he said was the broad road that leads to destruction, separation from God. How does that line up with Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, where he says, Judge not that you be not judged. Again, Jesus uses the Greek word krino, which means to condemn. Uh, we are not to condemn people. Jesus alone has the authority to say who can go into heaven and who cannot go into heaven. We don't have that authority. We can tell people, yes, you need Jesus for salvation. If you reject him, you're condemned already. But he removes the condemnation when we give our lives to Christ. You know, again, John 3, 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't come here the first time to condemn anybody, but that through him we could be saved. He came to bring everlasting life. Only Jesus has that authority. At the same time, the, the Word of God exhorts us. It encourages us to walk in wisdom and discernment. We are told to examine. We're told to test. We're told to scrutinize what other people say and do. Uh, we saw the Greek words are diakrino and anakrino. So krino means to condemn. Diakrino means to bring everything down to the main thing being the main thing. And, and we talked about this last time, Jesus. Who is he? Why did he come? Anacrino, you add up all the things that people say, and then you say, how does this line up with the scriptures? And that is what we are encouraged to do. So as we pick up in chapter 7, verse 15, we'll see how Jesus wants us to properly judge false prophets um, again, there's two roads, one to life, one to destruction. There's two trees, one that brings bad fruit, one that brings good fruit. We'll see there's two types of builders, one who builds on the rock, one who builds on the sand. So he, we'll see this pattern as he goes through this. So verse 15, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Jesus speaks in the present tense in this verse. In other words, you and I, we must continually beware of false prophets. Be on guard, be watchful, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. That's what Jesus is exhorting us to do. Notice that Jesus says outwardly, they look like sheep, but inwardly, in all reality, they are wolves, ravenous wolves, he says. Jesus calls them false prophets. The, the Greek word there is pseudo prophetes, which means a counterfeit prophet. You know, I talk a lot about pseudo Christian cults. They're just counterfeit Christian churches. I came out of a cult many years ago, so I understand what a counterfeit uh, church looks like, what counterfeit Christ look like, because there's a lot of pseudo Christian religions around us. Again, we don't judge them by just looking at them because they really do look like sheep. In other words, they can act like Christians. They can uh, say all the right things. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Good to see you, brother. I mean, people can do that. But inwardly, Jesus says they are wolves. What do wolves like to eat? Sheep and lambs, yeah, that's their diet. They love to eat lambs and, and sheep. Did you also notice in this verse, Jesus says, they will come to you. In other words, you don't need to go out and look for false teachers and false prophets. Just turn on your TV. They'll come right into your living room. Just turn on the radio. They'll come right into your car. 
when, you fi when they find you, you'll quickly recognize them because one of the traits of a false prophet, as we'll see in a moment, is they go for your wallet. They go for your purse. The Apostle John warns us, 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Don't believe any, you know, everybody that says, Oh, you know, I'd come to you in Jesus' name. Be careful. But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And Jesus warns us that many false prophets will come in his name and deceive many people. I encourage you to go through 2 Peter, especially chapter 2, because he deals a lot with how to recognize, how to understand, what to look for when it comes to uh, false prophets and their destructive, deceptive ways. Let me give you a couple of examples. In uh, 2 Peter 2, verses 1 through 3, Peter writes, But there were... Also false prophets among the people, speaking in the Old Testament, there were a lot of false prophets. Even as there will be false prof uh, teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them. So how do you deny the Lord? Well, you change his nature, you change his character, you change why did Jesus come, who is Christ, and you start changing those things around so you're denying who he really is. And they bring on themselves swift destruction, and many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed by covetousness. They will exploit you with deceptive words. You know, give to our ministry, and God will make you healthy and wealthy. That's one of the telltale signs. In the meantime, they're wearing their $1,600 shoes, their Rolex watches, they're flying in their private jets, driving their $250,000 cars. But they exploit you with deceptive words. Peter says, For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Eventually it will catch up to them. A little later, this is what Peter says, 2 Peter 2.14, Having eyes, speaking of these false prophets and teachers, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. I encourage you to read, um, I'm spacing out his name again, Benny Hinn's nephew, Costi, C-O-S-T-I, Costi Hinn. He's solid. But for a few years, he traveled all over the world with his famous uncle, Benny Hinn, and he talks about how they'd stay in $20,000 a night hotels flying in the private jets, just ripping people off. They'd come from Africa and just fleece the flock, and they were just living it up big time. Be careful. They cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices. They know how to, you know, get people and give, get people to give to them. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. So if God can use a dumb donkey, he can use me. But Balaam was a prophet for hire. Balaam was a false prophet. Uh, King Balak of Moab says, hey, I want you to curse the Jews. I'll give you up to half my kingdom if you'll do it. He wanted the money, and so God wouldn't let him. Every time he pronounced a curse, out came a blessing three times. He wanted the money, so this is what he does. He tells Balak, send in your best-looking Moabite women, seduce these young Israelite men, and God will get on their case. Sure enough, 24,000 young Jewish men were struck down by the Lord because they committed sexual sin with the Moabite women. Balaam never got to spend the money because a few chapters later he is going um, off thinking, oh, I got it made now, and he gets struck down by a sword. The sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, will f have its final say. The Bible is full of examples, full of warnings about false prophets and teachers, but Satan always has tried to counterfeit what God is doing, what God has done. But just knowing that they're counterfeit, 
you know, people out there know, should tell us there are genuine, there are legitimate people who represent the true teachings of God's Word. In fact, the easiest way to expose false teachers and prophets is to compare what they say with the Word of God. Again, this is our final authority. It's not me. It's God's Word. That's what we always need to go back to. If somebody claims to be speaking on behalf of the Lord, but what they say goes against the clear teachings of God's Word, do not believe them. Now, when I was studying this out, here's something interesting about what Jesus says for ravenous wolves. He calls them false prophets, ravenous wolves. The word ravenous is uh, harpax in the Greek, H-A-R-P-A-X. I don't speak Greek, so harpax, that works. Four other times that word is used in the New Testament, and all four times it's translated extortioner. That's interesting. That's why I found this pretty fascinating. Do you know what the definition of extortioner is? Here it is. It's the practice of obtaining benefit through coercion, through intimidation, threats, pressure, and sometimes violence. It's a person of authority who forces you to do something that you never intended to do. It's kind of like the mafia, you know? Hey, I'll protect you. Just give me what you got. 30%, and I'll protect you. So Jesus goes on to say, verse 16, You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Again, he's speaking to multitudes, thousands of people. The Sermon on the Mount, he's up overlooking the Sea of Galilee, and he's giving the Sermon on the Mount. And they instantly know what he's talking about. Thorns and thistles can never produce fruit. It's, you know, it's an agricultural society. They know these things. Verse 17, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. And so when you look at the end results of all those who practice unrighteousness, those who twist and distort the truth of God's word, the end result is they will be thrown into the fire. They'll end up in hell, separated from God for all eternity. This is a warning we see throughout the New Testament, but it's a warning we see throughout the Bible as well. Yes, we need to be fruit inspectors. And along with the Word of God is our optics for seeing clearly. Another thing that should be seen consistently in people's lives is the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You cannot produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit unless you are born again. In other words, is there genuine you know, love in their life? Is there joy? Is there peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Obviously, none of us are perfect. All of us stumble and fall in various degrees, in various ways. But at the same time, anyone who claims to be speaking for the Lord and speaking God's Word and teaching God's Word had better be growing and maturing and not messing around with sinful worldly things. By the way, when Jesus mentions thorns and thistles, He says they're incapable of bearing good fruit. The people immediately think, I know what he's referring to, Genesis chapter 3, thorns and thistles. This is part of the curse. Genesis 3, look at these verses starting in verse 17. This is what God did after he cursed Adam and Eve when they sinned against him. Then to Adam, he, the Lord said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which uh, of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Notice, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. Nothing good is produced by thorns and thistles. And you shall eat the herb of the field in the sweat of your face. You shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you are taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And so again, the unsaved people are still under the curse of Adam and Eve's sin. They're not born again. They cannot produce any good fruit. It's impossible. Only those of us who have truly been born again, saved by the Lord, can produce good fruit. 
Once again, though, it's not us producing the fruit. It's the Holy Spirit that works in us, and He works through us. We can't, like, I'm going to try real hard to work up some love today. You can't. I'm going to be joyful as I watch what's going on in the news. No, you have to receive what the Lord has for you. He produces it in us. They're still under the curse. This is why the, uh, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, those religious leaders persecuted Jesus after he died and rose from the dead. They still persecuted the church because they rejected Christ, the only means of salvation. This is true of every human being who is not born again. They cannot produce genuine fruit that is pleasing to the Lord. It doesn't mean unsaved people cannot do good works, but those good works can never save you. I mean, I know a lot of people have done good things over the years that have helped people, but again, those good things can never save them. Good works cannot. Only Jesus can. But good fruit, it can never come from a cursed bad tree. That's Jesus' point here. The good news is Jesus took the curse of God upon himself when he went to the cross of Calvary. Whenever a person comes to Christ for salvation and forgiveness of sin, he instantly removes the curse that was over you, and he gives you new life. He gives you, like Mark said, hope. It's a living hope. We're instantly changed from being a bad tree and all we could do, do was produce bad fruit to being a good tree. But think about this. When a new tree is planted, and you see it all the time. You drive through Palisade. You see those little tiny you know, peach trees. They just plant some new ones. They don't grow fruit right away. That's why we have to be patient with our brothers and sisters in Christ. If they're in Christ, it takes time and patience. It doesn't happen overnight. Give them a few years down the road. In the meantime, they're getting pruned. Ow! You know, they get fertilizer put around. Oh, this stinks. But God is using this to grow us and mature us, and then you'll be able to produce good fruit. So we need the fruit of patience, kindness, gentleness, when it comes to new believers in Christ. But going back to Jesus taking the curse upon himself, this is how Paul describes it. Again, this is in the context of being under the curse of the law. In other words, the laws we've seen cannot save you. The law is good if you use it lawfully to show us that we're sinners. That's why the law is good, because it shows us you are disobedient. You fall short. You cannot save yourself. The purpose of the law is to bring us to Christ. We've seen this. Jesus talked about, you know, those who try to, you know, say, I'm going to be saved by keeping the law, the Ten Commandments. Really? If you've had anger in your heart against somebody, you're guilty of murder in your heart. You've lusted after somebody. Yeah, you didn't commit adultery physically, but in your heart you did. You're still guilty. So this is what Paul says, Galatians 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. So if you're trying to work your way to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments, you're still under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Uh, again, the law requires perfect obedience 100%, which is impossible. That's the point of Jesus telling that in chapter 5. He says, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. You're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Again, 100% obedience is what the law requires to be saved, which is impossible. Remember, Jesus said, you must be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And their jaws hit the floor. It's like, what? First, you said we have to be more righteous than the Pharisees, who they thought were really super-duper righteous people. Now you got to say we're per we have to be perfect like God the Father? So they knew right then, it's impossible. The law cannot save us. goes on to say, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, a reference to the cross, that the blessing of Abraham might come, uh, might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we 
might be, receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Uh, again, the law cannot save you. It cannot produce good fruit in you. That only happens when the law brings us to Jesus. And when we come to Christ by faith, He gives us the Holy Spirit. And it's because we have the Holy Spirit in us that we become a new creation in Christ. It's because the Holy Spirit is in us that we are now redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's because the Holy Spirit comes in us that we are now sealed into the body of Christ. It's because the Holy Spirit is in us that we now are declared righteous. He has justified us and He's sanctifying us as well. Only then were we changed from being cursed, unfruitful, bad producing fruit trees to being a tree that is capable of bearing good fruit. Jesus says it like this in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Without Christ, you can't produce any good fruit. And again, we're grafted onto the good olive tree. That's what Romans 11 is all about. We've been grafted in to that living olive tree, and it's Jesus that produces the good fruit in our lives. That's a whole different study, but anyway, Jesus will now come to one of the more sobering sections in the Sermon on the Mount. Again, this is heavy-duty stuff. He's going to contrast two people, those who profess to be Christians and those who possess Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He'll talk about two builders, one who builds on the rock, Jesus, one who builds on the sand. So there's a pattern to what he's doing here, giving us that contrast. So, verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Remember when the Jews came to him in John 6, they wanted to know, what good works do we do to do the works of God? How do we make it to heaven? That's what they're asking him, what good works to do? He says, this is the work of God. One thing, you believe in him whom the Father has sent. That's all you can do. Put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone. Notice Jesus says here, not everyone who says to Jesus, Lord, Lord. It doesn't say not anyone, but not everyone. In other words, there will be those who say, Lord, Lord, who will enter the kingdom of heaven, hopefully all of us in here, but it's reserved only for those, he says, who do the will of the Father. Doing the will of God is simply putting your faith in his only means of salvation, Jesus. There are many people who look like Christians, whatever that means, I don't know, how do you look like a Christian? I've had a lot of people say, you don't look like a pastor. It's like, well, okay. I don't know what I'm supposed to look like, but this is it. But there's a lot of people, they don't look like Christians, or they do, I don't know. But they, they talk like Christians. Again, they know all the Christian lingo. They can sing the Christian songs. And yet, they're not doing God's will. In other words, they are not truly born again or saved when a person is genuinely saved, the Holy Spirit dwells within us, and it's the Holy Spirit who enables us, who empowers us to know the will of God, to live out the will of God. One of the most important things when you come to know Jesus is to come to know who He is, according to the Scriptures. you got to know who He is, why He came. Because there's so many people that change Jesus, and they give us a different Jesus. This is of utmost importance, because without a proper understanding, we will never understand God's plan of salvation. We'll never understand our own lost, sinful condition. If you don't understand these things, then you'll just cruise through life thinking, everything's wonderful, Jesus just wants to make my good life better. Then you'll write books about it, your best life now. Nonsense. That's not why Jesus came. The gospel of Jesus Christ blows away all the wrong thoughts that we have and the false narratives we come up with that we're good with God and Jesus just comes along when we need Him for some help. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. The gospel rejects that. The gospel tells us that we are sinful creatures who are born in sin. We practice sin. There's nothing good in us. 
There's zero chance that we can save ourselves, let alone wash even one of our sins away. So what's the gospel? Paul gives it to us, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. He says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, good news, which I preach to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. That is first and foremost. We have to know He died for our sins. What does that mean? I'm a sinner. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. We need Jesus. And when we understand that fact, then we realize there's no way we can save ourselves and make it to heaven. But that's why he came. First of all, to die for our sins according to the scriptures. I read one of those scriptures in Isaiah 53. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord laid on him all of our sin and iniquity. And that he was buried. So he actually died. He didn't swoon in the tomb and wake up because of the nice cool breeze and the cool tomb. No, he was dead. He was buried. Here's the other half of the gospel. That he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He alone, as God in human flesh, was perfect in every way. He alone is the perfect spotless Lamb of God. His blood alone is perfect and is the only acceptable payment for our sins. That's why he had to die. That's why he had to go to the cross for us. Verses like 2 Corinthians 5.21 makes this clear. It says, For he, the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin. Again, he was sinless. I'm going to emphasize that because I'm going to quote you something here in a moment. Why this is so important. He who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him so Jesus became the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute for the punishment that we deserve, for the penalty for our sins, the payment that we could never pay. Jesus became sin for us. So we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. Jesus did all this in perfect obedience to the Father's will. God did all this because of His mercy, His grace, His love for us. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It's only because of God's grace that any of us could be saved. And it's only because Jesus conquered the grave that He alone could offer us the free gift of salvation. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, and this is why it's important to understand, He bought you. He purchased you with His blood. Again, the only acceptable payment for our sins. This is where a lot of Christians are missing the boat, especially in America today. We do not belong to ourselves. You were bought at a price. Notice what he says here. For you were bought at a price. That was his blood. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's or which belongs to God. He purchased you. You belong to him. If you think I'm going to run my life, I'm on the throne, I'm going to dictate what I do, how I do it, then Jesus isn't your Lord, Master, Savior. You're doing your own thing. Be careful. This is what he's referring to. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Again, our lives are no longer our own. We belong to Jesus. He is the King of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He's the only door for salvation. He's the narrow gate that we must enter through. He told Philip, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's why it's narrow. It's only Jesus. Why am I making such a big deal about this? Because I know there are many people who are deceiving themselves and they wrongly believe that they're going to go to heaven 
Even though Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And the big reason why this is the case is because there are so many people, and I did it for many years before I got saved. I'm sure some of you have done it as well, where we created Jesus into our own image and likeness. We made Jesus who we wanted him to be. There's a lot of groups out there today. Just rub the magic lamp. Poof, Jesus comes out. Give you your three wishes. I want to be healthy and wealthy. Poof, there it is. That's all you got to do. Name it and claim it. Be careful. Jesus must be molding us into his image after his likeness. Unfortunately, there's so many false ideas and teachings about the person and the nature and the work of Christ. But do you know what will happen to those who follow a different Jesus and not the biblical Jesus? They're not going to go to heaven. A false Jesus cannot save you. The Jesus I followed, he was Jesus' name only, but he was a different Jesus. Dave Hunt wrote many years ago this article was called, Which Jesus or Jesus Who? Because every cult has a version of Jesus. Next door neighbors over in Utah. Jesus, created being, spirit brother of Lucifer. Eh? It's not in my Bible. And you can become just like Jesus. You'll be another God. You'll be over your own planet. Really? I don't see that anywhere in here. The JW, same thing. He's Michael the Archangel, first thing created by God. There's only one God, and so he created Jesus. That Jesus cannot save you. Only God the Son, perfect from eternity past, came into this sinful world, can save us from our sins. Anytime I talk to somebody that comes knocking on my door, I've always left them with this verse, depending on how things go. John 8, 24. Jesus says, Therefore I said to you that you'll die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. In, in the, the Greek, that he, word he, I am he, the he's not there. Any of your Bibles, it'll have he in italics. It means it wasn't in the original. Jesus is saying, unless you believe that I am. What does that mean? I am that I am. That's the eternal name of God, unless you believe that I am. God come in human flesh. Before Abraham was born, I am. They pick up stones to kill him. What good work? Why are you killing me? Why do you want to stone me? Not for any good work you've done, because you being a man make yourself God. The Jews knew exactly what he was saying. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the vine. So unless you believe that I am, Jesus says, you're going to die in your sins, because a different Jesus cannot save you. Again, why am I making a big deal about this? I mentioned it last week. I don't have time to go into the whole study. Uh, Probe Ministry, P-R-O-B-E. I encourage you to look it up. Probe Ministries, they did kind of like, um, I'm spacing out, getting too late. All right. They, they interviewed all these people 10 years ago, or 2010. They interviewed a bunch of 18 to 39-year-olds. I think last week I said 29. So all these young people, 18 to 39. 39 sounds young, doesn't it? Somebody, I, my daughter just turned 40 earlier, and it's like, you're old. Jeez. Anyway, all these 18 to 39-year-olds, 2010. Now, here's the caveat. These all identified themselves. Again, I'm identified as a born-again Christian. 18 to 39-year-olds who claim to be born-again Christian. 2010. 30% said Jesus is not the only way to heaven. Really? I'm the way, the truth, and life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. So that's bad enough. 2010, 30%. 2020, they did the exact same survey. Ten years later, 60% of all those who claim to be born again from 18 to 39-year-olds say Jesus is not the only way to heaven. 2010, 15% Jesus was not perfect and probably sinned. I don't know what Bible you're reading, folks. So 15%, 2010, 2020, it's doubled. 30% of those who claim to be born-again Christians say Jesus was not perfect and he probably sinned. 
Almost half, 47% in 2010, believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God and that Jesus is God come in human flesh. You think, that's bad. Only half believe that the Bible is the inspired Word of God from born-again Christians. They only believe, half of them say it's inspired. Only half believe Jesus is God come in human flesh. Well, it's worse because in 2020, 25% said the Bible's inspired, that Jesus is the Word of God. Sounds like the, you know, the parable of the sower. Remember when Jesus goes out there and he talks about the parable, throwing the seed, the Word of God. One seed hits the hard-packed soil. Satan, the birds come, take it away. Next seed falls on the shallow soil, quickly springs to life. Oh, praise the Lord. But then it quickly withers away because it didn't have any root. It wasn't truly born again. They just acted like it. They like being around the crowd, but then it died. And then the other one fell among the thorns. And as Jesus says, the deceitfulness of riches chokes out the word of God. Only one fell on good soil, one seed, one out of four. So here's one out of four, 25% believe the word of God is actually the inspired word of God. The only, only one fourth believe Jesus came uh, it is God who came in human flesh. So the conclusion, when you go through this study, they blame, rightly so, they blame pastors and churches for not teaching God's Word. That's just the bottom line. They're not teaching the Word of God. They're just tickling people's ears. Gee, or Paul said the time will come, and it's here, when they'll no longer endure sound doctrine, but having their ears itching, they'll accumulate for themselves teachers. That's what they want, teachers that will tickle our ears, make us feel good about ourselves, make us feel good that we're in sin, make it seem like everything's good. Be careful. Verse 22, this is why we need to be careful. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? In the name of Jesus. We see a lot of that. Cast out demons in your name. You got a demon of chocolate. Really? I don't think that's biblical, but I think I'm a glutton. I mean, I think my flesh likes chocolate, but I don't think it's a demon. Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. So not just a few people will say, Lord, Lord. Jesus says many people will say this to him on judgment day. These are people that Jesus says are false prophets. They appear to be casting demons out of people, but it's just a, a, a charade. They're charlatans. Whatever signs and wonders they're doing, they would fall under the category of what Paul says, lying signs and wonders. I came out of a cult. They live off of miracles, Christian science. My grandmother was a practitioner for many, many years. She got paid to heal people. I saw people get healed. And that's what kept them coming back for more lies. Satan is a, an author of lying signs and wonders. I got to lead my grandmother to the Lord shortly after I got saved and delivered from that when she got cataracts and she couldn't see across the table from me. And I finally was able to say, Grandma, Jesus loves you. Jesus can save you. It's all about Jesus. And she broke down and got cataract surgery. She could see. And then she was so condemned by all of her Christian science friends, she couldn't go anymore. They didn't want her back, even though she was a big part of that ministry for many years. It was praise the Lord, though. She got delivered. God can do it. But lying signs and wonders, these are people who are total rip-off artists. They operate completely in their greedy flesh, or they're operating under... The power of Satan. So Jesus says to them, verse 23, this is so sad. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Sobering words indeed. Lawlessness means uh, practicing iniquity. You're, you're practicing wickedness. When he says, I never knew you, now don't think, oh, Jesus doesn't know everything about everybody. No, he knows everything about these people. The word is gnosko in the Greek, which simply means he did not know them in a personal way. He, they didn't have a personal relationship with Jesus. 
So these people never were saved. They were never born again. They never surrendered their lives to Christ. Paul says of these people in 2 Corinthians 11, 13, for, their, uh, for, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So their end will be to depart from Jesus forever. This is not just a New Testament thing going on here. I mean, God's given the Jews and us warnings throughout the Old Testament. I mean, this is a great one in Deuteronomy 13. I say great because notice what he says here. If there arises, Deuteronomy 13.1, if there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and notice, and the sign or the wonder comes to pass. Oh, wow, seeing is believing, right? Of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. So they're doing something that looks legit, but then they say, no, we're going to go after this other Jesus. He's not quite the same as the biblical Jesus. Just a little different, but let's follow this path, this Jesus. He says, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And the Lord goes on to say that those false prophets were to be stoned to death in Deuteronomy 18. Today, what do we do with false prophets? We turn them into celebrities as they fly around in their $50 million jets, crying poor. It's, it's yeah. Sorry. Okay, one more contrast. Let's wrap it up. Verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, not just the immediate things he's saying here, but this for the whole Sermon on the Mount, he's referring to this. Therefore, who hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock." Again, a couple things to note here. Jesus wants us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, as James tells us. We need to live it out in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, I will liken him to a wise man. Then verse 26, But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Again, the multitudes of people that are listening to him knew exactly what he was talking about as, as, to, as it pertained to building houses in Israel. From the ground up, they all looked the same. From the ground up, you couldn't tell a difference. But they knew because there's many sandy, dry areas throughout Israel. In the wintertime, the heavy rains can come, and it can totally rearrange the landscape. You know, washes the sand over here, there, whatever else. So you would either build your house on the sandy soil and just hope for the best, or what they would do is dig down through the sand, find the bedrock. And once they would find the bedrock, then they would lay their pillars down there, and then they'd build the house on the top of that. So when the rains came and everything else hit, it did not fall. It did not come to ruin. And again, you couldn't see the difference until the storms came. And then it would, you know, determine the weakness or the strength of the house. But it was all based on what it was built on. You can have two people sitting next to each other in church, both raising their hands, singing hallelujah, clapping right along, both carrying their Bibles. Nobody could tell the difference until the storms of life hit. That's when you can tell what the foundation of their lives are built on. One who built their life on the solid rock of Jesus will eventually make it through victoriously. The one who built their life in the shifting sands 
What does that mean? That's well, just the vain philosophies of this world. That's just listening to everybody and all the talking heads out there that don't know Jesus, and they're telling you, this is what's going to happen. Our world's going to die. Now it should be, what, eight years since AOC said it's going to die or our planet's going to die in 12? Now it's got to be at least eight or ten. That's all we got left. I hope she's right. Read Revelation, folks. Book of Revelation says not one creature in the sea is going to survive. Not one tree is going to remain. It's all going to burn up. All the grass are going to burn up during the great tribulation time. Everything, Jesus says, is going to die. Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But Jesus comes back, and we come back with him, and he's going to establish his kingdom on earth. It's going to, he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. And then it's going to be like the Garden of Eden. And I don't think we're going to need electric vehicles during the you know, millennial reign of Christ. We'll be in our resurrection bodies. We'll be flying all over the place. So vain philosophies of this world. So obviously the best thing you and I can do is keep building our lives on Jesus Christ. Verse 28, And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Well, that's pretty obvious because Jesus wrote it. So he teaches them with authority. He is God come in human flesh. This is his word to us, inspired these writers, the Holy Spirit, inspired them to write these things down. So the first century church, how did they make it through all the trials and persecutions that quickly came their way? They built their lives in the solid foundation of Jesus. How do we make it through today? We've got to continue to build our lives in the solid foundation of Jesus. Jesus said, in this world, you'll have tribulation from the world, the flesh, and the devil. We're not destined for the great tribulation. That's God's wrath that he'll pour out in these last days. But we're not destined for that. 1 Thessalonians 5.9, Romans 5.9. Keep those in mind because we don't go through the great tribulation. Judgment from the world... Satan's attacks, just stuff of the flesh around us. We'll go through that. We've all, a lot of us have faced things, horrible things, and yet we're building our foundation on Jesus. What are the pillars of our foundation? I'll leave you with this, Acts 2.42. It says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the word of God. And fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is why our home fellowships, we call them life groups, this is why they're so important, this is why they're so vital, because this, these are great places, these are wonderful opportunities to get together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, to encourage each other, to build each other up, to love one another. Remember, there's like 32 one another's in the New Testament, and that's where it takes place in this home fellowship setting. I encourage you to get involved in one of our life groups. Well, you'll get into the Word, you'll exhort and bless one another, build each other up in the faith, and this will take place as we continue to build our lives on the solid rock foundation of Jesus.